Excellent. Okay, over to you then, Hannah. Beautiful. Well, welcome everybody. My name's Hannah. I'm an occupational therapist at MND Queensland. And today I will be introducing pressure care. Um, so we'll have a look at what that means, what uh, puts a person at risk, how to reduce these risks and prevent injury to our skin. So pressure care refers to relieving sustained um, pressure or minimizing rubbing on the skin to help protect the integrity of the skin and its underlying tissue. So there's always pressure at some point on our body because it's how we support our body when we sit, when we lay, uh, when we sit to stand, standing in general, or even when we're looking to hold something, we use that pressure. You can see this picture from Queensland Health and how different positions that we're in put different pressure on different areas of our body. So you can see those little red X's are all our at-risk areas when we're in certain positions. So it's when this pressure is sustained and unrelieved. So for instance, if we don't move around in bed, that we start to have problems with our skin. And we call this pressure injury. Um, it's previously known as uh, pressure ulcer or pressure sore or bed sores. Um, we don't use that terminology anymore, but you'll, um, some people still use it a bit interchangeably. Um, so what causes pressure care on our skin? So bony prominences or devices rubbing or sliding against the skin tissue, it leads to breakdown of that skin. So if the skin is fragile, there's also reduced tolerance to this rubbing. It might be fragile for a bunch of reasons. Um, it could be poor nutrition. Uh, we might not be able to attend to hygiene as best as we can, or there could be other lifestyle um, or underlying health diagnoses that can lead to more fragile skin. So the most common areas um, that will get pressure injuries are places like our heels, our elbows, hips, buttocks, uh, the tailbone. However, your risk really depends on which position that you find yourself in most commonly during your day. It also needs to be considered that while the bony prominences, so those um, hips and, and, and elbows and heels that stick out are generally the cause of pressure injury, it isn't always the case. So you can get pressure injury on anything that sticks out um, or when an object presses against you. So I had a gentleman once that had one on the tip of his ear because of a seam of a pillow um, that kept moving around. I also had a colleague who had a gentleman and it took a while to figure this one out. He had a pressure sore right in the center of his buttock cheek. And it turned out that that was um, due to friction and the protrusion of a tape measure that he kept putting into his back pocket. So in short, uh, pressure injuries can happen anywhere that there is pressure or friction um, and to anyone that has sustained pressure that doesn't get relieved. So why is this important? So the breakdown of skin or the pressure injury, it, it can be painful. It does put that tissue at risk of infection and other complications because in the later stages, it is an open wound. Um, it's impactful on our day to day as well as our mental state, because um, generally you'll have increases in services to treat it because it, it is considered an acute injury. There could be potential bed rest while it heals. Um, and it's also that mental coping of, of the look of the sore that can look quite um, severe. And they can also produce things like odour, which can be quite difficult to, um, to, to um, experience. Um, once the skin has a pressure injury as well, it, it is predisposed to future injury because it won't heal as strong. So when our skin heals, particularly from an open wound, it generally heals with scar tissue. Um, and that's not like the skin it was before. And it can become more of a frequent battle in our day-to-day -day lives um, to continue to manage that area of the skin. So one of the biggest reasons I believe um, that we want to prevent pressure injury um, is because the treatment is so much more time and um, time consuming and painful than it is 
to prevent one. Um, preventing it is, it's, you know, it maintains our function in the long term. Um, at the end of this um, session, I'll show you a short video. It's a gentleman who, who just had two pressure injuries, but he was in hospital for four months for the management of those injuries. That's not always the case. Um, it really depends on where the pressure injuries are and um, what your function looks like. But it's just putting it out there that if it is in an unideal um, position, you know, they can take significant amount of times to, um, to heal. So the evidence based on expert uh, opinion for treatment of a pressure care injury on, for instance, your bottom or sacrum, which is near your tailbone, identifies where the seated position can't be avoided completely, um, that you'd need complete bed rest, and seating should be limited to three times a day for 60 minutes or less. So that's a maximum of three hours of the day um, out of a sideline position. Um, so that's not very much. So uh, that's 21 hours of your day in bed and, and three hours sitting. So that's quite an extensive functional impact. For most people, that's difficult. For people with M and D, that might, we, you know, where we contend also with things like muscular changes and, and, and respiratory complications. Um, following these recommendations is not always possible, um, which means that we end up with an extended healing process. Um, so, as mentioned, you know, there are some circumstances where, where staying seated to treat a pressure injury um, won't be appropriate. It could cause things like tearing of the wound or it might not be a position that will relieve pressure. Um, in these cases, you end up in bed um, essentially until, until that wound heals. So, um, the bed rest in its own, because we're not doing any of that ad hoc movement, um, further leads to things like muscular changes and respiratory complications and deconditioning, all factors that as um, a community that, we, that we're already aware of and trying to manage the risk of. So to add a pressure injury treatment on top of that, we definitely want to avoid um, you know, tr so so just a, a summary there that we, we really want to take a preventative approach um, to help optimize our function and, 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 and um, continue to remain independent as much as we can. So how do we know that, um, so, so now we know how to prevent it, we need to know what puts us at risk. So occupational therapists use a variety of screening tools um, to, to look at risk factors for, for both fragile skin and pressure injury. So these screening tools typically cover a person's sensory perception. So whether they're able to feel or voice pain and discomfort. Um, so you're not going to know if you have a pressure injury if you can't feel it. Um, and if you can't communicate that, you know, you're not feeling comfortable and you need to move, um, you're less likely to um, be able to um, get the assistance that you need to, um, to, to make those movements or at least take longer. Uh, we look at moisture. So if the integrity of the skin is compromised, um, then, then as I mentioned, it can, um, it can uh, reduce the tolerance to things like rubbing and pressure. So if it's constantly wet, which might be from perspiration, it could be because um, our continence isn't quite managed as well as it could be, um, or potentially we're not drying properly after a shower. So there are, you know, the, between our toes remain wet or um, under our arms is not quite dry. All of that can reduce the integrity of our skin. Um, on the opposite spectrum from there, you can also get dry skin. Um, so that makes our skin more susceptible to things like friction and shear. Um, I'll go through what those are a bit later. Um, but, you know, dry skin, if, if you rub at it, um, you know, you, you end up with flaking skin. It's more prone to irritation. The screening looks at um, activity, so how long you spend in a chair or bed, um, because if you spend a long time in those um, positions, obviously we have more sustained pressure risk in, in particular areas of our body. We look at mobility. So if you have difficulty moving your arms or legs, um, we're less likely to try to move them. Um, and being on dependent on others to move them will usually result in less overall movement um, for a variety of, uh, of reasons. 
Uh, we look at nutrition. So if our skin isn't getting nourished um, with, with um, or hydrated, so if we're not taking in enough water or enough nutrients, our skin is more prone to damage. Um, we also look at weight. So skinnier people um, generally have more protruding bones to rub up against our skin and larger people generally have more moisture or difficulties um, with friction between the folds of skin. So I've mentioned friction and shear a couple of times. So the main difference is, so friction would be like if you've got your, your hand and you rubbed your knuckles across it, um, you, you can irritate your skin just by the rubbing of, of something hard against something soft. Shear force is, is a little bit different. So shear force is, is similar to opposing forces. So for instance, if you were to take someone by the feet and drag them down a bed, the bones are moving down, um, but the bed is staying in the same place. Um, and that results in opposing forces for your tissue. So here's my little ad hoc demonstration. So if one hand were the bed and one hand were the, um, the, the, um, bones, the tissue um, ends up going at an angle and pulling down the bed. So that's essentially shear force. Um, you can see, if you couldn't see my little demonstration on the photo there, you could see a little picture on the slide um, that shows how that tissue essentially gets stretched and strained between the two opposing forces. We also look at circulation. So if there's impeding circulation or oxygen to the delivery to the skin and tissue, obviously that puts it more at risk. This could be due to an underlying diagnosis like a heart condition or a device that we're using. So um, I think I mentioned this a couple of times in this presentation, but things like donut cushions, we, we, we never recommend because it restricts oxygen flow to the bottom. So if you're not sure what a donut cushion is, it's essentially a cushion that looks like a donut, round cushion, little hole in the middle. Um, and when we sit on that, um, our skin and our bones generally fall into the middle of that cushion um, and it restricts the flow of blood to that high risk um, sacral or tailbone area. Another um, uh, common um, example would be, for instance, putting a hair tie on your wrist. Um, you would have seen the um, little dent that that could make in your wrist. And that's showing you that we've got um, sustained pressure and even though slight, um, might be restricting the flow to your, to your fingers. The other thing we look at is your history of pressure care. So as mentioned, um, if you've had one before, you're more prone to get them again, and that's because of the tissue um, that heals that skin. So for persons with MND, we are mindful that the risk factors are likely to increase with the progressions of symptoms. So level of activity will generally re reduce, so we're more likely to spend more time in certain positions. Um, our mobility changes, so when things start to become more effortful, like sit to stand, you might find that you're feeling your skin drag on surfaces a little bit more, um, and that results in the increase in friction and shear. Uh, while the risk factors do increase, it does not mean that we will get pressure injuries. It is an assertity. Um, and when we are concerned about the risks, there are ways for us to manage and prevent pressure injury with the right daily routine, care plan, and pressure relieving equipment. Um, it's largely thought between um, a lot of practicing professionals that um, there isn't really any reason we can't prevent all pressure injuries. Um, it's just a matter of, of figuring out what's causing pressure and getting on top of it before it starts um, to impact our skin um, in the stage two and later stages, so the more um, uh, injurious acute stages of, of healing a wound. Sorry, um, about pressure care, I just want to make sure I'm on top of it. Yeah, was that a question? Okay, I'll, I'll just continue. Um, so another uh, risk factor that surprises people is everyday equipment and therapeutic equipment and medical devices that get used. All of those can actually cause pressure injury. So things like bedpans, um, BiPAP masks, um, any tube that gets taped to the skin, call bells that we have on our wrists or our belt, hearing aids, everyday items next to us. So we might be in the recliner and have a remote next to our thigh that might be pressing in, or we might be in a wheelchair and pop our wallet under our leg or, or, or to our side. 
they can all place pressure on the skin. So they all present at, as some potential risk. Um, if we see the warning signs of pressure areas in those areas, uh, pressure injury in those areas, and we'll review what those warning signs are a bit later. If safe to do so, we make sure we remove any and all pressure from that area during our day. If you're not sure how to do that, you want to make sure you give your care team, your allied health team or your nurses a call so that we can find alternate um, management strategies. So a lot of people might be looking there going, oh, um, my call bell or my BiPAP mask. And um, it you know, I'm not saying don't don't use them. I'm saying we need to know the signs of pressure injury to see if in our situation with our variables, with our skin integrity, um, that that isn't causing a risk and um, or causing an injury or we're not seeing those early stages of injury. And if we are, that we need to discuss what the alternative um, arrangements um, that can be made with those items are. All right. That's a bit of a picture there. So further risk factors include impactful transfers. So if we're doing heavy or plonking standing to sitting transfers, so kind of just falling back into our recliner or a hard surface like a commode chair, it can result in a deep tissue injury. So a deep tissue injury isn't a numbered stage of pressure injury, but it's still considered a pressure injury because it results from um, impact to the tissue. They kind of look like blood blisters and they are commonly mistaken for bruising. Um, the tissue looks like it's intact, but it has actually died. Um, and that wound will eventually open up and, and um, be an, um, considered an, a, a pressure injury. So we need to be aware for where, when our transfers aren't quite going as, um, as they used to. Effortful transfers also cause us a risk. So as I kind of alluded to before, if we're starting to have more difficulty doing that sit to stand movement, chances are that our thighs and our bottom will be rubbing against a recliner or our bed sheets as we're trying to transfer and that increases the friction um, and the shear force on our, on our skin as well. Falls can also result in pressure injury. Um, it might be due to the impact of the tissue on, on the surface we fall on, and that can result in that deep tissue injury. And that's usually when we start thinking, oh, that's a bad bruise. Um, it might be from that, or it could be because post fall, um, we're in a position that we can't move from and we have that sustained pressure um, on what areas of our body um, uh, happen to be on the floor. Another risk factor which surprises people is pretty much any layer between yourself and a pressure relieving surface. Um, so this includes things like bed uh, sheepskins, bed sheets, slings, Kylie's, continence pads. If we've got any of those items between us and the bed or us and you know, a recliner pressure relieving surface, it actually reduces the benefit um, of the aids that we have in place because it essentially hammocks or it stops immersion of our skin into those pressure relieving surfaces. Um, so for instance, a fitted sheet over an alternating mattress will, will mean that when the, the cells of the alternating mattresses have deflated, that our skin isn't actually being relieved. We're just hammocking into that fitted sheet. Um, so where we're trying to completely offload pressure, we're actually only reducing the pressure and not offloading the best that we can. So if we've got an active pressure injury, that's gonna be essential for our healing. Um, so for those without pressure injury though, having a sheet on an alternating mattress, it really just minimizes the impact of, of that alternating mattress in, in helping us address our pressure um, risks and, and, and concerns. All right. So how do we avoid pressure injury? So there are literally thousands of aids designed with pressure care in mind. You could buy them all and as well as creating barriers for your independence and comfort, you still might not have the best setup to help you prevent pressure injury to the area that you need it to. So when we prescribe, so by we I mean occupational therapists or nurses prescribe pressure care equipment, 
We're looking specifically at the areas we know that are at risk and we weigh up and consider a variety of factors because the best item for your skin might not be the best item for you functionally. So for instance, an alternating air mattress is the only device on a bed you're going to get that completely offloads pressure to different areas of your body. We wouldn't prescribe it to everyone though, but though, because if you have one on your bed or if you've ever tried them before, getting on and off a mattress um, that's alternating is a lot more difficult for you to be able to transfer independently. There are other things like the pump might disturb your sleep or the sensation you feel with it alternating might make you feel a little seasick. So unless you had an active pressure injury or a significant risk of developing one um, and you were still transferring um, sit to sand from your bed um, by yourself, it wouldn't be something that I or hopefully other professionals would um, prescribe for you. Um, so even though it would be the, the, the most absolute way of protecting your skin, we know that functionally it might not be the best suit for you. And I mentioned this as I'm going to review a lot of products later in the next, in, in a few slides, um, but whether or not they're appropriate is very specific to your level of function and your level of rest. So it's more of a guide so that you're aware of equipment, um, but I'm by, by no means saying go out and, and, and get this equipment or um, ask for it. It's, it's best to have a chat with your OT or your nurses about what what your level of risk is and, and what, um, what we can do to help weigh up your independence versus managing that risk. So there are a few general practice things you can do to minimize your risk of injury though. So the first one would be awareness. Um, being aware of your function and seeking assistance. So if you notice that your transfers are getting heavier, you're starting to plonk more. If you notice that you're dragging across surfaces more, have a chat to your OT about transfer training or transfer equipment that can help reduce that risk. If you think you're at risk of falls, talk to your OT about ways to minimize the chances of falls or getting a falls alert pendant to minimize the chance that you might be on the floor for, for any period of time. This can be mentally one of the hardest things for people to do is be aware of their function and seek help, um, particularly if, if things have progressed in a short period of time. However, having that awareness and seeking that help is really going to be key to optimizing and preserving as much independence over time as we can manage. The second key principle would be taking precautions, uh, basic precautions to assist. So the, the, the most basic precaution would be making sure that we're shifting weight by either walking or leaning forward and side to side or tilting your chair or placing foam wedges, which we can move out. Ideally for someone at, at lower risk, we're looking to do at least three minutes of offloading in two hours. So that means changing our position for at least three minutes every two hours. Some people do this by walking, so getting from your recliner to the bathroom or, or changing from a seated position to a, a lay flat position in your recliner. Um, and what that three minutes does, it allows for what they call total perfusion. And that's the blood completely returning to your tissue that had the pressure on it um, while you're in whatever position you're in. So I've got some fairly specific angles there. So if you were in a wheelchair, the, the advice is that we want to have 25 to 40 degrees of tilt with 110 to 150 degrees of recline. Um, I find that really funny because a lot of people would just have no idea what that looks like in a wheelchair. Um, if you've got a power wheelchair, some of them actually have um, little um, degree, um, I forget what they're called. They show you at exactly what degree you're up, but you need someone else to be looking at that while you're doing it. Um, if you're not sure what that looks like, again, um, have a chat with your OT or, or, or whip out a um, something that shows angles and um, and have a go at it once and you'll, you'll get a feel for the position. It doesn't need to be exact every time, but just so you've got an um, idea of what that degree looks like would be good. Um, so that's every two hours for three minutes for someone at low risk. Um, if you're looking at higher risk, um, so, and again, you'd figure that out with discussion with your OT or your nurses, or you had a previous history of, of pressure injury, you might want to up that schedule. So that's um, for some people every uh, 30 seconds, every 30 minutes, 
or 15 seconds every 15 minutes. And that sounds like so much. Like who wants who wants a reminder every 30 minutes to 15 minutes um, to be changing positions? For a majority of people, you'd be really surprised you're probably doing it naturally. Um, it, it, but, you know, it, it is a very good thing to be mindful of. Um, and if, for instance, you, you were at particular risk, it would be something that I would be I would be looking at, at, you know, how often we are actually doing it without being aware and whether or not we, we do need to set up more um, formal supports to make sure that we're meeting a, a particular schedule. Um, so again, if you don't know how or you don't think it's possible for you to be able to be shifting weight um, that amount of time, definitely have a chat to your health team because like I said, your prevention is, is going to be um, much easier than, than your treatment. So even though 30 seconds every 30 minutes sounds like a lot, it might be the difference from complete bed rest during healing. So um, uh, definitely a, a, a much less preferred outcome. All right. So another step for protecting from pressure injury is taking care of your skin. So as I mentioned, fragile skin is much more prone to pressure injury. So making sure we stay hydrated, keeping a bottle of water close by with an easy open lid, because the harder it is for you to get water, the less you will drink. And that's absolutely for everybody. Unless you, I know, I know that's true for myself. Unless I have a bottle of water at my desk, I know that I can go a full day um, without getting a drink of water. Um, some people set alarms. So, so, you know, in the morning, at, at lunch or in the afternoon to make sure that they've had a good drink. Um, there are little devices like the Ola Hydration Reminders. You can see it in that top picture there. It's that little green thing on the bottle. What that does, it, 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 um, it registers when the bottle's been tilted, essentially. And when it hasn't been tilted, it flashes a little light um, to remind the person to, to have a slip. Um, and I believe it does that every two hours or so. Um, making sure we get appropriate nutrition. So ensuring we're um, consuming an ad adequate diet. Um, if you're not sure what that means um, in your circumstances, definitely making sure we have a consult with a dietitian. Um, if you're having problems swallowing food, um, definitely have a chat with your speech path as well. Managing continence. Um, we obviously don't want our skin to be wet. So having a talk to a, a continence nurse or ensuring we've got the correct supports and aids in place to help us remain dry, as dry as possible. Keeping the skin clean and dry. So if you're struggling to wash and dry yourself after a shower or attending to your post-toilet hy hygiene, asking your OT to review your needs. So things like long handle drying aids can be beneficial to make sure we get a, a nice um, clean between our toes. Um, there are even more extreme things. There's a full body dryer in that bathroom um, and that's literally just kind of like a jet of warm air. Um, so if you're living independently that's a, a, um, and not seeking supports at the stage, um, that can be a good alternative to make sure that we're drying our skin prop, um, uh, properly. Um, the last one there is making sure we're sun safe. So um, obviously burnt skin or dehydrated skin is, is going to um, be irritated to begin with and more prone to injury. So those are our key, our general key principles on looking after your uh, pressure care without any specific advice to your needs. So all of those principles. And honestly, I think that they apply to everybody, um, it, not just those um, at risk of pressure injury. There's a whole bunch of um, health and wellbeing outcomes that would um, be achieved by just att uh, attending those key principles. Um, next, we're going to talk about equipment that relieves pressure, which is specific to needs though. So. Um, like I mentioned before, please remember um, there isn't one aid that's going to reduce pressure in every area of your body. Um, there are opposing functional and pressure care pluses and minuses. Um, so again, this is a guide um, and prescription of the aids really um, is really so specific um, to, to, to uh, person by person. All right, so... The most familiar pressure care equipment people recognize are pressure care cushions and the mattresses or overlays. So they generally come in foam, gel or air or combinations of those materials. Um, the main differences are foam allows the body to immerse into a cushion, but the pelvis remains on top of the foam. So it's like that first picture of the pelvis there, it kind of goes around it. 
um, whereas gel and air can form to the shape of the body. So you can see it will um, actually form, um, go into all those nooks and crannies. Um, so where the foam is reducing pressure care, um, the gels and the airs have a greater surface area of distribution. Um, so are a little bit more in, in terms of you're, if you're more at risk, you're more likely to go down those area, uh, those those pathways. Again, they've all got pluses and minuses, though it's just not down to, to those two factors. Uh, there's also alternating air mattresses. Um, they're the only aid that completely offloads pressure. Um, if you're unfamiliar with an air mattress, there is a, a picture in the middle there. There are lots of long air tubes together um, and every second, third or fourth will completely deflate um, and then inflate um, at different areas to offload to different areas of the body. Um, so again, while it's their best for pressure care, functionally it might not be good for everyone as well as the difficulties with transfers I've mentioned. If you've got, for instance, a cat um, you, uh, that you you know goes onto your bed, for instance, it's, it's not ideal unless you want... Um, a, a damaged pressure mattress. Um, again, people who smoke in bed or smoke in the wheelchairs, air is generally not a um, pathway I would go down. Um, depending, again, depending on function and circumstances, I might try a static air mattress, like a, low, uh, a Rojo insert or overlay, or a gel foam bed. So you can see the bottom picture there is a, is a Rojo overlay inside a bed. Um, so that one reduces pressure. It doesn't offload, but it reduces pressure. Um, and then at the very, so the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see, oh, bottom right-hand maybe for your your side left hand, um, is a bed cradle. So if you're at risk of pressure injury to your toes, um, potentially to your angles, depending on how you're, you're laying in bed, um, that will help um, prevent the um, pressure of the blanket on the toes. And believe it or not, uh, just heavy blankets also can cause um, pressure injury. All right. So sit to stand recliners, they help us in a better position to transfer, which can prevent us from plonking into the recliner. They can also reduce the shear force and friction when we try to stand. Um, I say reduce because the bottom is actually going to be sliding in the recliner when it rises. So there is some element of shear there, but this is generally less impactful than a really effortful transfer. So some recliners, so in that middle one there, you can actually get inserts with pressure for pressure care cushions, like air or gel pressure care cushions. Um, that can be an advantage because when you put a cushion in a recliner, it does reduce the height of your armrest, which can also make things more difficult. Um, so again, that's just sort of the way up of, of pressure care and, and the person's function. Um, you can also get standard equipment with pressure reducing seats. So toilet seats, shower commodes, over toilet frames, they can all come with um, special foam or gel seats on the top um, that are um, nicer to the skin than your, than your hard plastics. Um, all wheelchair accessories generally come these days with either padded or gelled um, footrests or knee guards or, or, or things like that. Um, you can also get foam wedges that can be inserted um, or positioned with your body in certain ways to help re remove pressure or shift our weight during the night um, or to help us sustain a, a, a side-lying position. Um, you might want this position if, you're, for instance, your, your bottom is, is at risk or showing some stage one um, pressure injury signs, and that will completely offload the pressure without having to um, move towards an alternating mattress if, for whatever reason, that's not going to work for us. Um, the bottom picture there is a calf support um, pressure uh, positioning pillow, but that removes the pressure completely off our heels if our heels are at risk. I didn't mention before, one of the risks to the heels can actually be um, shoes that are too tight. Um, we all get uh, previously, um, we've all had previous shoes that um, we take them off and you can see sort of the indents of the shoes around our toes or the, the blisters from the rubbing. Um, that puts us at risk. And when we're seeing those sorts of signs, we want definitely parts of a day at least where we're completely offloading the pressure to our ankles. You can actually also get pillows with air cutouts if you are at um, a risk of pressure injuries to your ear. So the gentleman I had that had the one on the tip of his ear, um, we just used a positioning wedge and, and changed his pillow because we knew the seam was actually causing the injury. Um, so I never went down the route of prescribing this particular pillow. And 
personally, when I look at it, it looks like you'd have to lie in a very specific position, which as we now know, you, you generally don't want to do for pressure care in general. You want to be moving every couple of hours. Um, but I'm sure there would be some scenarios um, where I might use that in a problem solving combination of looking towards a pressure care plan for somebody. All right. So things you don't see on the list. So there are a few high risk items that occasionally pop up with people I visit, um, all of which actually increase our risk of pressure injury. So electric blankets, um, they create heat, perspiration, and they also place a layer between yourself and the mattress. Um, they also put seams under your skin. So the elements on the, on the um, uh, blanket itself can protrude into the skin. All of these create risk factors for pressure injury. I know they can be popular because um, people get cold, um, particularly if we're not moving around as much. Um, but ideally, we'd be looking at alternative methods for, for getting warm um, than an electric blanket. So sheepskins, many people like sheepskins. And subjectively, I have had a variety of people report that they are comfortable with them. Um, it should be noted, though, that there is no evidence that the generic um, synthetic sheepskins have any benefit um, overall. There are a small number of low quality studies that medical grade sheepskin, um, so proper wool, um, has some benefit. Um, the international guidelines don't provide any specific recommendation regarding the use of medical grade sheepskin, uh, but that's due to the low level of studies. Um, my opinion on the matter of sheepskin is it's probably very comfortable on the skin. I've heard some interesting theories on how it might promote air circulation, which increases comfort. Um, however, if they were beneficial for pressure care, I believe it would be well documented by this point. So I think they probably increase comfort. They're not doing you any harm by the evidence that we've got, but they shouldn't be considered a pressure relief device. So again, we weigh up. It's not all, all about your skin. It's about comfort. It's about function. So potentially it would be an okay solution for someone as long as we were aware that the, um, the, the outcome we're looking for is comfort, not pressure care. Um, the donut cushion is also on there. So I've already explained how that can help um, cut off circulation um, through sliding through the center of the, um, the hole there. And that's well documented that it actually increases our risk. All right. So other methods of avoiding pressure or share include ensuring our equipment is the right size. So for instance, if we've got an over toilet frame that was too small, we'd be squeezing to fit into it, which would place hip, uh, pressure on our hips and thighs to get into a good position. If it were too big, we would likely experience shear force and pressure as our pelvis protrudes into that center hole, similar to the donut cushion. And while this would hopefully not happen if you've been prescribed the equipment, I have seen it happen a lot with borrowed equipment. So um, someone trying to be very helpful and friendly, oh, I've got this in my garage, have a go of it. Um, if it is too big or too small, we, we, we could end up um, causing ourselves more problems. We want to ensure that our equipment is supporting our body. So if, for example, someone's um, legs are not supported in their wheelchair, um, they could be, their, their legs could be impacted by that unpadded framework of, of the chair or the armrests or, or, or the sides, um, resulting in pressure points. Um, if you start noticing your equipment is not supportive, um, as it was before, um, this is a good sign you need to contact your OT to review or the, your physio to, to review prescription of that equipment. There could be aids or other things that we can do to help support your body. We want to reduce, um, so avoiding pressure again, we want to reduce um, sliding positions. So reclining a headrest in um, the bed, but not putting a knee break in, likely create a slide down bed. Uh, we want to avoid placing items on or under our body when laying or sitting. So using side bags, over recliner tables, um, even pop the TV remote on the partner next to you. Um, all of those can avoid um, that additional pressure at our at-risk areas. Um, we want to take advantage of the pressure relieving surfaces we have in place. So making sure we avoid layers, 
you know, having sheets, you know, that's a, a standard um, want. You know, we want our bed to look um, the same as it always has. There are particular sheets that you can get. So we always look at four-way stretch fabric sheets um, on our bed. We make sure they're not fitted sheets and we don't want to be doing our nice tightly tucked hospital sheets because all that um, strain on the sheets, again, is going to minimise the amount of immersion um, or pressure relief we're going to get. We want to avoid seams. Um, we want welded seams if possible. So welded seams are, are where, for instance, the zip is um, hidden, um, it's not exposed. Um, and when we touch the surfaces, we're not feeling any abrasion on our skin. Um, the expert advice um, around manual handling equipment. So this comes up quite often. Should we leave, should we leave a sling under someone um, if they're if they're difficult to transfer or it's difficult to put a sling under them, or should we remove it? Um, the, the expert advice is that you should never leave a sling under someone, and that's because you know, the seams of the sling itself could be causing pressure injury, could be bunching up behind the person. Generally it's generally not, not not as comfortable as sitting on a pressure relief surface and also aesthetically a lot of people don't like sitting on them um, but by all means I know people who would prefer to leave it under them because it's just too hard to get it in and out um, in that case my again I weigh up the risks and I have a discussion about the risks um, sometimes getting it in and out of the person can cause significant amounts of friction and shear as we try to manipulate the sling um, around the person. Um, so in some circumstances, it might be the best um, best option, but it's the better of um, two difficult situations. And, and as long as people are aware of that risk and I have that discussion with them, um, you know, uh, it can go either way. But again, the expert advice is we never leave anything under a person. Um, so, because all of these aids and equipment are person and risk zone specific, pressure care requires frequent review. So your pressure care needs now may different from your needs in two to three months time. The same equipment might not be appropriate in both instances. So if you notice some warning signs that you are pressure care compromised, remember to contact your care team, your OT, your nurse immediately. So we can have a review of those items and make sure that when we're not going down the road of, um, of getting a more severe stage two and up injury, we want to catch it early. Okay, so that brings me to the last point about what are the warning signs and how do we know if we are pressure care compromised or if our weight shifting routine is sufficient. So weight shifting routine might just be your normal daily routine, hopefully it's sufficient. The best thing that you can do for yourself to make sure everything is on track track is doing daily skin checks or requesting your care staff do it as part of their um, care routine in the morning. Anyone with any kind of movement difficulty can get a pressure injury, not just people requiring a wheelchair full time. So form these good habits to keep your skin safe. So skin checks involve directly inspecting or using a mirror for yourself to inspect your skin. Stage two and up injuries are quite obvious because they're open wounds. Stage one is what we are hoping to catch so we can manage it before there is breakdown of skin and that subsequent open wound. What we're looking for are painful areas of the skin, red, purple or blue skin, blisters, swelling, dry patches, Shiny areas might indicate we've essentially exfoliated a lot, which indicates a lot of friction or warm areas of the skin. So you can see a couple of pictures up there of some stage one pressure injuries. Um, I also equate it to, for instance, when I cross my legs during a meeting, um, I will get a mark very similar to a pressure one um, pressure injury. Um, so in this case, however, when I see the red mark on my leg, I compress into that tissue and I know it's going to go white and then pink again. And that's because blood flow is returning to my returning to my thigh. The mark is gone within minutes because my blood flow is returning to that area of the skin as long as I put my feet flat on the floor. And because of these reasons, I know that I don't have a pressure injury, but I am aware that I have just reduced the circulation to my leg. So if you notice any red or purple marks, generally you want to just press it. 
You want to know, does it go white and then quickly pink again? If not, you're likely are or leading to a stage one pressure injury. If you notice this mark and if it's safe to do so, um, avoid any pressure to this area. Increase your weight shifting routine, um, particularly to that area, so offloading pressure to that area. If you can't remove the pressure completely, you need to, um, you, you want to make sure that you definitely get in contact with your care team. You want to do that anyway, even if you, even if um, you're not sure how to reduce the weight or, or the pressure onto that area. While these stage one injuries might look minor, there is a lot more damage underneath. If we can't avoid pressure to this area, stage two will be close behind, and this will result in like an open sore or blister-like wound uh, making its way through that top tissue in the skin. By that stage, you will require a wound, uh, wound management schedule because you have an acute injury. We want to avoid that stage and any stage after this for all of the reasons we talked about um, before um, about uh, having to treat treat the wound. So a pressure injury can develop and progress over any period of time um, due to the large amount of variables that may be contributing to it. It might be minutes if you've got the perfect storm of poor skin integrity as well as a lot of risk factors. The guidelines generally indicate though that you'd see them after two to four hours. Um, however, that really depends on the amount of pressure you're getting to those points. Um, once it's developed, you're going to have heaps of eyes um, on that wound and, and that's to make sure it's healing, but also so we can figure out what caused the injury and how to avoid it. I'll show um, if we've got time and where that we're running out of time, I might save it to the end just in case. Um, there is a short video about um, what, what a pressure care check looks like, or skin check looks like, I should say. So how do I know this stuff? Um, so pressure care is a foundation skill for occupational therapists and we learn about it and its prevention through a lot of our studies. I also follow the international guidelines for best practice. They were developed by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel and the Pan Pacific Pressure Injury Alliance. And it compiles all the evidence-based practice over the world and it's been updated over time. And we're currently up to our third edition. So if you ask me about an equip piece of equipment that I might not be aware of, I would look it up in these guidelines to see what the evidence says about the risk that it poses. I also follow the Queensland Health recommendations, but they essentially follow the international guidelines, um, but I review their information to assure my um, practice remains relevant. Um, all right, I'm going to attempt to put the video about the pressure care check up. We'll see how I go with that one. Um, whoop. All right, so I'll just flick back here. Oh, that's not working for me. All right, you're going to get a bit of a blank screen for a second. See how we go. This is a just an, an outline of what pressure it is. It is your responsibility to perform your checkers. own skin inspections regularly. One of the most important things you can do to prevent pressure injuries is to check your skin and look for any changes. This should be done at least twice a day or more often if needed. Use your eyes and hands to check your skin carefully. Good times for skin checks are before getting out of bed and when returning to bed. If you discover a pressure injury, it's important to find and eliminate the cause. This may mean you have to stay in bed. When you check your skin, it is important to look at every part of your body. 
make sure to pay extra attention to common sites that are at higher risk for pressure. When you get up in the morning, check your back, shoulders, hips, and heels. When you transfer out of your wheelchair at night, check your sitting bones and back. To assist you, you can use a mirror or use your smartphone to take a photo or video. If you need help, ask your caregiver to share in the responsibility of checking your skin. Just a short one there. I hope if you, you hear are that, unable to move yourself while you're in bed, quiet you should be on a turning schedule. Uh, we'll turn that one off. Um, beautiful. And that is about all I have for that one. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to um, um, go through them. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, then we can go back to videos for a second. No um, so if I um, muted you, I might be able to unmute you, but everyone else will need to unmute themselves. So if you could please do that, and then we can see if anyone's got any questions. Is that done? I hope I've done it right. Here we go. No, no questions. Wow. Okay. Well, you must have been very thorough then, Hannah. If uh, <laughs> we've got nothing to question you on, so um, we'll wrap up if that's the case. Then thanks again, Hannah, for that. That was really, yeah, um, really informative for for us, and I hope it was for our clients as well. So thank you, everyone that has joined us today. It's nice to see your faces, um, and I'll let you know when our next um, guest presentation is, so that you know what the topic is. Okay, hope to see you soon.